When I first came to um, to India and met with my my Lama come to Rinpoche, uh, one of the first things he said was, "Always remember that Tibetan Buddhism is uh, half Dharma and half Tibetan culture." So of course you can throw out the culture, just don't throw out the Dharma. But of course, as we all know, it's not so simple. It's not this is culture, this is dharma, like this. I mean, by now it's got like this. And it's sometimes very difficult to remember what is just culture and what is a genuine Buddha dharma. But the one thing about the dharma that is, um, we can see in its, in its long history is that whatever countries and cultures it arrived at, it adapted itself. It didn't really expect the culture so much to adapt to it as it adapted to the culture. It's like every country it went to, Thailand, Sri Lanka, China, Tibet, Japan, Korea, wherever, it put on new clothes so that, um, you know, it, it looked outwardly sometimes very different but the, the same body was wearing those clothes. So once you took those clothes off, you found the body was surprisingly looking the same in all these different cultures. And I think this is the richness now, after a thousand years of separation, when at these conferences, when so many different um, aspects and, of Buddhism come together, like at the Sakidita, this uh, international Buddhist women's organization, when we all come together, women from dozens of different countries, nuns and lay women both, outwardly looking so different. Do you know what? The, the only thing the nuns have in common, as far as their, their appearance is concerned, is their shaven heads. They all have shaven heads. Beyond that, they're wearing, of course, maroon, they're wearing yellow, they're wearing black, grey, brown, white, and pink. And they chant in a different way. And uh, sometimes their, their social customs are very different. But when you take all that away, we are all Dharma sisters. We are all Buddhists under the skin. And I think this is a big surprise how similar we all have the same view. And so I think for Buddhists everywhere, the important thing is the view. Because once we have the right view, as the Buddha himself said in the Fourfold Truth, once we have the right view, then everything else falls into place. How we, we then look on what is important, what is not important, how we have to proceed. And for example, always in Buddhism, so much importance is given to the mind, training the mind, and um, realizing that what we say and what we do depends on the prior intentions. So while our mind is filled with negativities, we are going to cause suffering for ourselves, suffering for others. When our minds and our hearts, mind and heart being the same in, in uh, Asian thinking, when those are filled with positivity, then our actions and our speech will be positive. I mean, it's so obvious. And yet, that is the, the ground of Buddhist thinking, that if once we, we really purify our hearts, everything else follows from that. And then what do all Buddhists have in common? Well, we all take refuge. We take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. We recognize that what the Buddha taught was something really very precious for our life and beyond time and beyond location since we always have our minds with us and as far as our 
afflictive emotions, our anger and our greed and our jealousy and, and our basic ignorance of how things really are, are concerned, we haven't really progressed very well, have we? I mean, 2,600 years later, we still have monkey minds and we are still churned up with all these negative emotions, our greed and grasping and attachment and our, our anger and aggression and just even depression is uh, this, this great modern phenomena of deep depression in society. It's based on the negative roots. And so all of these, these problems which the, the Buddha was helping us how to treat and how to cure are very much with us now, just the same as they were, you know, millennium ago. It's not like we've now moved on from those things. We are still stuck very, very deeply in the, in the swamp of, of samsara. We haven't gotten ourselves out at all. So the Buddha message is, is there as much as anything. And then, of course, beyond the refuge of the Buddha and his teaching and the community of those who have really understood that teaching, who can act as a support, like a, a doctor and his, his medicines, his therapies, and then the nurses helping that therapy so that we can be healed from the poisons of our afflictive emotions. Beyond that, then, there is the reason why do we want to get beyond our, the misery and the suffering that we have in our hearts, which we are causing not only for ourselves but for others. Well, because exactly that. We look at our own suffering and then we look in the eyes of the people around and we see their suffering. I mean, even when people are looking pretty good and they're affluent, educated, everything's fine, you get talking to them for five minutes and it all comes out. All their worries, their problems, their, their, their deep inner sense of futility which our modern life is giving to us that so many people feel, well, on one hand they've got everything, on the other hand they've got nothing and just accumulating more and more of the same isn't going to solve anything because the pain is still there. And so in this way the Buddha Dharma can be extraordinarily helpful for people because it addresses exactly those things. It doesn't just say, well, you have to be good. It shows us how to be good and why and what, what that would, how that can help society as well as helping our families and our friendships and our our job situations and everything. I mean, there's so much technique there. It's not just a lot of truisms and cliches about being kind and love and goodness and compassion, but how to develop those qualities with the underlying understanding that we actually already have them, only we don't know it and that we should not identify so strongly with that which is negative in ourselves or in others, but should also really have the pure vision of, of seeing people's inner goodness, which is there the whole time, even though it's still covered up. So I think, you know, the, the motivation to, to purify ourselves so that we can genuinely be a benefit to help others likewise to get out from this, this terrible situation, this hopelessness in which so many people are completely drowning. Uh, and you know, understanding that what we do, our actions do have results, not just in this lifetime but in many lifetimes to come, that we are not, and that what happens to us is the result of of um, seeds which we ourselves have planted. Otherwise, people, when if we are good people and, and bad things happen to us or we lose people we love or we become extremely ill at a young age or all the tragedies which can happen in this lifetime and people rant and rave and say, why is this happening to me? And feel completely 
completely unable to know how where to turn. There's no refuge for them. Then the Buddha Dharma is very sane. It says, well, we have had so many lifetimes, and in all those lifetimes we have done so many things, good things, bad things, neutral things. Eventually, the results of those will come up, like planting bad se black seeds and white seeds. When the causes and conditions come, they will ripen. So we can't do much about that. Those seeds have already been sown. But what we can do is how we respond to those seeds as they come up. If they are weeds or if they are good plants, we can make use of both. We can really learn so much from the difficulties so that even those difficulties turn into something which actually, spiritually speaking, is helpful. And when things are nice, then that's nice. But when things are not so nice, well, maybe this is just what I need to learn. So in this way, we are planting good seeds for the future. Moment to moment, we are creating our future while we're eating up the past. And even just thinking like that, it can help us put things into a perspective and make meaning out of our lives, even if there are lives with a lot of suffering and a lot of problems. And suddenly, it's not meaningless. We can learn so many qualities from our difficulties, which we cannot learn when everything is just very, very smooth. And again, there are techniques, there are ways, there are methods for helping us to deal with these things. Not just, as I say, not just talking about it, but actual meditations and practices and reflections to really help us gain that inner fearless courage to deal with life, whatever life has to offer us. So these are universal, and, and in all Buddhist schools they are there, but in the Tibetan school it is especially emphasized. So that has nothing to do with culture. That has just to do with being a human being. And the, the essential Buddha Dharma has nothing to do with what you wear, what you eat, you know, um, how many times you pray or don't pray. It, it's not anything to do with something which was relevant 2,600 years ago isn't relevant anymore. It's astonishing how what the Buddha talked about is just as relevant today in any culture as it was when he spoke in the plains of India so long ago. So I think that we just have to look at what, what is the essential teaching there. And, and not forget it by getting caught up too much in the, the outer ritual and the, the outer manifestations which are, are very culturally based. And what, for example, goes down well in Tibet would be considered very impolite in China. Whereas what happens in China would seem a little strange in Tibet. And it's not that either is right or wrong, but it's both... Uh, you know, based on, on the culture of those countries and the expectations of how uh, someone should act within those countries. For example, if you offer me water, then in Tibet I don't want any more, I will go like that. Whereas in China that means please give me more, right? So when I go to China I have to remember to go like that, right? So like this or like that, what difference does it make? You know, it's just a matter of, of which culture you happen to be in at that particular point. I think it's very important that we should not discard something which is so integral to the teachings simply because it doesn't happen to sit with my own preconceptions. Um, because I was brought up, say, in a Western culture where people on the whole don't believe in, in rebirth, or if they do, it's a kind of hippie version. Um, therefore, you know, to say, well, I personally, I don't believe that I was ever reborn. I think this life is all we have, and next life, when we die, our consciousness finishes. Uh, and whatever happens to us, it just happens, and it doesn't have any previous um, 
causes or conditions for it to happen because I personally don't believe in it therefore the Buddha couldn't have said it or if he did it's because he was just voicing what was um, acceptable in his day and age I mean that's astonishing arrogance how just because the Buddha doesn't happen to agree with my particular views therefore he couldn't have said it or if he did say he, well, he was wrong if we cut out karma and rebirth from the Buddhist picture we're just left with this life well Nirvana obviously is nonsense um, if things just happen and since Buddhism is non-theistic there's no reason for them to happen so it's very arbitrary and so this is okay if you happen to be somebody from a fairly affluent educated family who's making your way but so many people in this lifetime are completely trapped in apparently hopeless situations well that's just too bad and obviously bodhicitta goes out the wall I mean you can't possibly be praying to attain enlightenment out of um, the desire to, to benefit all sentient beings if you've only got this tiny little lifetime and if you look in the Pali Canon all the way through I mean the Pali Canon being considered probably the, the closest rendition we have nowadays to what the Buddha might have said, had said you know we don't exactly what the Buddha said we're all agreed he doesn't we don't really know because it took hundreds of years to be written down but people had phenomenal memories in those days so it must have been something like that since it keeps going on and on and even in other um, like where people have found ancient texts um, in Dunhuang etc etc in all sorts of different languages and different tradi uh, traditions of Buddhism they're all still saying more or less the same thing there is this underlying theme and um, so he must have said something like that and it, it's permeated with the idea I mean recently I was giving teachings on the Terigata which is um, uh, the record of nuns from the time of the Buddha who um, attained enlightenment and liberation and again and again and again they keep going on about how now rebirth is cut off I don't have to come back I'm free from that I'm now I'm liberated what they liberated from they're liberated from having to keep being endlessly recycled in samsara and many of them talk about their past lives how what they did before which created their situation in this lifetime and so forth I mean it's it's I can't say how anybody can say the Buddha didn't teach rebirth because the whole the whole scheme is based on the idea that we are trapped in samsara endlessly endlessly being reborn, re-dying, reborn, re-dying endlessly how to get beyond that and so I mean if you're saying that the Buddha just talked like that because that was what people believed in that day then you're saying the Buddha wasn't enlightened he wasn't a Buddha because he didn't really know he was just picking up what was current in his day which again it means that there's no Buddha so you've got no Buddha and no Dharma then you know all you've got is a feel-good therapy for this lifetime so that's fine but it's not Buddhism <laughs> oh who knows I mean one just wishes that you know I mean if the Buddha came back now um, how he would dress his monks and nuns for example who knows I mean I don't, we have no idea he certainly wouldn't have us looking the way that we all look which are all based uh, either on the robes which were extant in his day for ascetics or um, in China on, on the robes which were um, sort of medieval kind of clothing that people wore as in Christianity with the nuns wearing medieval costume at the time of their founders 
So it's a, it's always a very a difficult, um, you know, to get everybody in agreement. This is the problem of what is essential, what is not essential. I think one has to, in this case, maybe look at all the various costumes worn in all the Buddhist countries and see what they all have in common. And then in the Vinaya also, keeping in mind that the Buddha was talking about a situation in 600 BC. Um, but what did he consider? Well, first of all, he would consider it very important that one's dress was somewhat distinctive. Because um, if right from the start, uh, monks and nuns dress differently from lay people. They look different. So this was a way for people to recognize, ah, this is a monastic person. And this is why I think it's very important for monks and nuns to continue to wear the robe of some sort so that people, lay people, can see and recognize that this is a monastic dress. Because when the Buddha left the palace as a prince, when he went out on his um, excursions and he saw um, the old man and the sick man and the dying man and he, he understood that you know there was a lot of suffering all around. But then it was the sight of the shramana, of the monk, that gave him the way out. Then he understood what he could do about this, to go beyond sickness, old age and death. That was the path, the path of the renunciate. And so for people in, in our daily life now in the West as well as in Asia, who are so desperate and, and just cannot f know where to turn, what to do, where is a solution to the meaningless of their life, the futility of their life, the stress and the strain for nothing, which everybody is, is endlessly just striving towards. Then the sight of a renunciate could be something very deep and very meaningful for them. Therefore, I think it's important to have ropes. What those robes look like, every country has made their own decision, as we see. So that when you get monastics of all the Asian countries coming together, uh, there's not that much that they all have in common, including the color, only their shaven heads. But I think that uh, also that the, the dress should be modest. I'm not sure that I think that Tibetan robes are modest, not for women. And many uh, nuns feel uh, uncomfortable, especially in India, traveling around showing their bare arms. And for example, when I was in uh, Hong Kong taking my uh, bhikshuni ordination, and since I was taking the bhikshuni ordination, I thought I should look, um, you know, pucker acceptable. And so um, I, I wore bare arms, and uh, which I normally would not do. In those days people didn't bother so much. Um, and then I heard that everybody was saying, how is that nun so, um, I don't know, what's the word? I mean, to flaunting herself, her skin, by, by, by being bare armed and not covering herself up modestly. And even when I lived in Italy, I always wore long sleeves for that reason, because uh, Catholic nuns always uh, keep their arms covered. I mean, it's considered you don't show your flesh like that, you know, that is not modest. And, and it's only in the Tibetan tradition where nuns uh, do in fact show bare arms. I mean, in all the other traditions, most uh, Mahayana and Theravada, the nuns are covered up modestly. So, I mean, exactly, you know, how one is going to do all this, looking at the culture in which you are now, you are going to be living and settling in the West, and the kind of connotations that people have in how people are dressed. I would say that one should be dressed 
modestly and that also, you know, that the clothes naturally should be somewhat loose fitting so that they're not provocative. How far down they go, I don't know. How much they, they still um, take on the, the Tibetan appearance is up to them. It's, I don't know, you know, in, in Taiwan there is one nunnery which studies Vinaya and they are, they have robes which are sort of Chinese but they're more maroon colored and they wear a kind of almost like a Zen because uh, having looked at the early texts they think that that's closest that they can come to, to how the Buddha, um, you know, how the monastics looked in the time of the Buddha. So, you know, that's something everybody has to discuss together. But I think the, the important thing is the appearance it gives to people when they see you, especially when they don't have any context of who you are. Well, of course, in the Vajrayana, the relationship with the guru, with the lama, is, is extremely important. And although it can also be very problematic, depending on the guru, um, it is nonetheless something which is very much stressed within the Vajrayana system, unlike in other uh, aspects of Buddhism, in like in Theravadan Buddhism and also to a certain extent in the Mahayana, that total openness and surrender to the guru is not emphasized in the way it is within the Vajrayana system. So although it can indeed create many problems depending on the integrity of the Lama, uh, one cannot say that therefore it is not something which is essential. Many Lamas stress that the most important thing is uh, one's devotion to the Lama and Bodhicitta. And that if one has that, that's enough. That through that, through one's openness and devotion to the Lama, then the heart opens and from that comes the blessings to recognize the nature of the mind and therefore to progress on the path. And the bodhicitta prevents us from uh, doing this purely for the sake of our own ego enhancement and uh, keeps us very actively um, motivated through compassion and a sense of interconnection with all beings. So uh, some very advanced lamas feel that the, the, the two most essential things which must never be lost, I mean visualizations and mantras and so forth suit some people very well, other people they find it in this modern day when our minds are already so complicated and so filled up that it's just another complication and therefore they they would much rather just not um, you know stress their mind out more uh, with all these visualization practices and rituals other people find it very enhancing so it depends on the person it's not right or wrong it's just different personalities need different therapies but everybody seems to always agree that, nonetheless, uh, a, from one's own side, a personal sense of connection with the Lama is very important. Even if one cannot see the Lama very often, and one is not getting personal direction from them, that doesn't really matter. I mean, as it's been said, you know, like the sun is always shining, it behoves us to open up the windows and the doors and let the light in. If we keep the curtains closed, then however much the sun shines, it, the, we're not going to get the benefits. So for us, the opening up of the curtains and opening the windows wide is, is uh, our devotion to open up the heart. The, the Lama's heart is always open, but our hearts have to open and then the blessings naturally come spontaneously. We don't have to be in their presence. And so for most of the teachers that I have ever met, they again and again and again I hear the same thing being said, that, you know, the path is devotion. And that from that also 
the underlying motivation is, is bodhicitta. So those are two things which shouldn't be dropped. Of course, we all know very well that Buddhism is essentially patriarchal, hierarchal, and essentially medieval. Once we get, once we understand that, then we can get on with the job. It's, of course, women have been overlooked for centuries, millennia. But nowadays, as Buddhism is always talking about impermanence and change, so things are also changing in that direction. As the key is that women are becoming educated. As long as women were never educated, and that very much includes nuns, then they had no voice. And so their ideas, their thoughts were never expressed. And if they were expressed, they were not written down, and so other people could not share in them. And so therefore they were always silent. Through, if you look at Buddhist texts, you can see the great silence of the women. Where is the women's input in all this? And so that is just a, a fact of the matter that up until very, very, very recently, women just were an invisible background. The ones that did the serving and took care and looked after the, the male half of the um, the Buddhist world. Of course there were great female practitioners, but because they normally didn't say anything and uh, were not very educated normally, then they, you know, they had no voice, as they say. But nowadays things, everything's changing very rapidly, considering. Despite resistance, uh, for example, in the Tibetan tradition, now nuns are becoming very well educated. Next year there will be, well this year actually, um, there will be about 30 Geshe Ma and uh, hopefully also the whole uh, question of um, the higher ordination for nuns, the Bhikshuni ordination, will now be resolved, we hope. Eventually it will have to be because now there is more and more awareness and pressure not only from uh, the West, but very much from other Asian countries, asking how come in the Tibetan tradition there are no fully ordained nuns. And as the nuns become, live in, in better, well-run nunneries, um, definitely the, their whole sense of status and self-worth grows. On the other hand, in East and West both, the majority of serious Dharma practitioners are women. If you take away the women, you've got the Lama sitting up there on his throne in a practically empty hall. And who's going to make him a cup of tea? So the women are a very essential part now of the Dharma activities. And of course in the West, many of the most popular teachers are the females both nuns and, and lay, and also an understanding that actually when women are given the opportunity, they often reveal much more affinity with meditation and the spiritual path, the genuine spiritual path, than uh, their male counterparts. And I have met a number of meditation teachers, including some very austere Theravadin teachers, who spontaneously told me, I did not bring it up, they spontaneously said that their best students were, were women, because women are at home in the intuitive, is what they said that they, do un they are not threatened by these, this level of consciousness which does not rely on, on anal analysis and thinking. The Dakini, you know, dancing in space. 
And so they said that once women get their basic emotional ups and downs stabilized, then that they go much higher, much faster than the men who tend to want to have the ground under their feet and go up stage by stage and they don't want to jump. In addition, it seems to me that also from a tantric point of view, the female physiognomy, far from being a disadvantage uh, on the spiritual path, which is normally how it's been presented, actually it could be a great advantage. If one thinks of the male anatomy, then in uh, Tantra, which is very much based, the inner Tantra is based on the um, bringing up the, the sexual energies up through the, the central channel. It's very much based on, on how to transmute sexual the sexual energies. Then when you look at the male anatomy, it's already, it's, it's on the outside. And so they have to bring it in and up. And so this is always a big problem for them, to be able to do that properly. Whereas women are already inside. And so for them to take that energy, which is already internal, and take it up, is relatively easy. And for this reason, Tumo is a very easy practice for women while it's quite a difficult, challenging practice for the men. This is true. I mean, I, even the abbot of a yogini nunnery in Tibet uh, said the same thing. He said all his nuns are very, very good at tumo. They find it very easy. And uh, the, the, he said that their inner physiology is much easier for them than the men. And, and then I thought about it, and I thought, well, yes, it makes sense, of course. In fact, many women who have nothing whatsoever to do with Tantra or, or Tumo or any of these practices spontaneously feel the Kundalini rising when they meditate and don't know what to do with it. Um, but Kundalini also is a female energy. So I think that in this, this day and age, now that women are educated, they can read the sutras, they can do all the practices, and uh, they are perfectly able to think logically and clearly, as well as to, to practice everything which has been traditionally only given for the boys, I think the sky's the limit. Well, first of all, of course, this is said mostly from the standpoint of a Protestant background. In a Catholic country, they don't think like that. I mean, in a Catholic country where monasticism was always highly honored, um, if they are still genuinely Catholics, then they will still understand the, um, the need for a section of the community who are totally devoted to um, the, the celibate life. I think it's very unfortunate nowadays that um, in our modern society celibacy is considered as something almost unnatural and that obviously if you're leading a celibate life you're going to end up really very weird and warped because when I think of um, so many hundreds of monks as well as nuns whom I know I mean, so many of them are the nicest, most relaxed and, and open human beings I know. They, they don't seem in the least bit either uptight or, or... I mean, you look at them and just the way their whole demeanor shows how comfortable they are in their bodies. And also how comfortable they are with being with men or being with women without making uh, any discrimination. So I think from that point of view, it, it, it's, you know, this, this whole idea that there's something, you know, definitely weird about people leading a life of purity is a very, very sad comment. 
secondly, although I know that there is, is perversity happening in, in celibate communities sometimes, I mean in Christian and Buddhist both, but that's not just for monastics. I mean the lay community is likewise extremely perverse. Uh, I mean, you know, all the various uh, pornography and, and, and child prostitution, etc. That's done by people who are often married uh, with families. You know, you can't say that, the, oh, if you become married and you have a family, you're going to, you know, not, not get caught up in pornography or perversity. So, I mean, that, therefore, that's irrelevant. On the other hand, not only from the point of view of personal practice, um, when one is trying to lead a life of, of, of renunciation and to really overcome one's internal attachments and so forth, it is often very much easier if you are in a community of like-minded people who are not caught up in, in intense intimate relationships and um, that one's sexual energy is directed in a different direction. I mean, that, that, that this energy is used for something beyond merely propagating the species or uh, cultivating more sensual pleasure. And in addition, it, it simplifies life, actually. When I, I so many women come to me and they're all caught up in... in complicated relationships and there's this one and then they go to that one and then it just you can see it doesn't just not just a physical thing but it just takes up all their emotional and mental effort and and energies and I always think well how what a relief not to have to bother with all that because also in a in a monastic community you're not worrying about what how you look and for women especially, you know, where who you are depends on your appearance. You know, that you stay young, you stay beautiful, you're attractive. When you're in a situation as a nun, you don't have to think even about any of all that. Such a relief. Oh, who cares? You know, you're neat, you're clean. You look like everybody else. You don't have to worry about bad hair days. And there you are. You know, you don't have to worry, what shall I wear today? You know, what kind of event is it? Should I dress up or not dress up? I mean, we all know what we're going to wear today and tomorrow and next year. And, but for society, it's so important. As I said, with the Buddha, you know, that he saw the image of a monastic to remind him of something beyond just the normal round of existence, that there is a way beyond it. And so for people everywhere, it's so important to have symbols that people can recognize of people who are living a life of simplicity, purity, contentment, with little, and are happy. You know, that they have nothing that the society says you have to have, otherwise you're going to be miserable. They've given all that up, close intimate relationships, lots of possessions, an attractive appearance, money, security, they've renounced it all and yet they're happy and they feel free. And I think it's really important for people to have that in their midst, to remember that there is another way to live in this world. Otherwise, there's no escape. Well, I think that it, in this Tibetan Buddhism, it can be very useful. I mean, sometimes the traditional view is that step number one, you leave your household, you leave your, your, your community, you leave everything behind, and you go and live in a cave. 
Um, but in actual fact, I, even in Tibet, very, very few people took that advice. And most people, um, either they joined the monastery or else they, they stayed practicing in their household. And so I think that, you know, I think we have to understand that the Buddhism is not just about meditation. In the West, mostly when you say Buddhism, people think of somebody sitting. And while cultivating the mind is, is a very essential aspect of Buddhist practice is not the only aspect and therefore for this reason uh, I also and many others are, are emphasizing you know, the other paramitas, the other qualities like generosity and ethics and patience and the, the lojong practices of taking all difficulties onto the path the, the quality of compassion and loving kindness, recognizing all beings want to be happy, the ability to have a, more of an outreach to your society. You know, not enough just to sit there thinking, may all beings be well and happy, but how about going out and trying to help them? And, and in these ways, the, our daily life with our families and in our workplace or in whatever we're doing, if we cultivate these inner qualities, then it becomes a Dharma practice. Along, of course, with trying to cultivate more mindfulness, uh, which is a very important, that one stays as centered as possible uh, throughout one's activities and just doesn't allow the mind to go all over the place and become endlessly distracted, you know, with memories of the past or anxieties and for the future, but tries to stay as much as possible here and in the present and to deal with situations in a way which is incorporates our Dharma principles. In that way, the Dharma, you know, it might not necessarily always be very profound because there's no time to go very deeply into it. But it will definitely um, permeate our, our, our thoughts and our, our speech, therefore, and our actions, and transform. And at the end of the day, that's what counts. I mean, as Paula Natisha always said, you know, we, we have to see, our, is what we're doing really dealing with our negative emotions or not? Because if it's not, then what's the point? So we can use our daily life, our daily irritations and problems and stresses as part of our path, rather than seeing them as obstacles to the path. Really, we, we have to look, go back to the basics. As I said at the very beginning, our view. And not only from um, a meditative point of view, but also from the point of view of a view of what is important and what is not important in this lifetime. And, and in that way keep a sense of balance so that the Dharma does really merge with our daily life. It's very important as Westerners, most, you know, in Asia people mostly were brought up as Buddhists, so they, they, many of the principles they wouldn't be able to articulate, but they've got it there because it's, it's part of their society. But in, in the West, then we were brought up sometimes with some different ideals, although Christianity and Judaism, etc., still inculcate a lot of the same principles that the Buddha Dharma does. Uh, but still, a lot of the attitudes have had to be deliberately learned. It, it didn't necessarily come naturally. We had to think about it. But this is also not a bad thing, you know, to all the basic principles, the basic ideas, the precious human body, karma and rebirth, 
impermanence and death um, and uh, the wretched state of samsara and so forth. These are, they seem like kind of dogmas, but nonetheless they are based on how things really are if you look. And so each one, as the Buddha recommended, we don't just learn something, but we really go away and think about it and the implications of it and think about it and really try to understand it and until it really becomes a part of how we see things and how we react to things. And in this way, uh, slowly, slowly, we, our mind stream becomes Buddhist. Not just because, the, you know, we've read some books, but because we're really beginning to see things with these eyes. We have a whole different view now. And often that is very different from society. But as Atisha says, you know, the, the, the highest conduct is to be in disharmony with the world. So, you know, really it's, it's based on seeing things with clear eyes and integrating that into our daily life rather than specific practices and doctrines which is up to the individual. But really seeing everything is impermanent. We're all going to die. I mean, that is not Buddhism. That is just a fact of life which most people want to ignore. But once we really think about it and integrate that into our, our, our mind, by rights, it should shift something very fundamental in the way that we relate to ourselves, in the way that we relate to others, and so forth. So, so many of the doctrines which are very simple and we all read and go, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, then we lose somebody we love or we discover we've got cancer or something awful happens. How do we react? Do we act like an ordinary worldly being who's never heard anything? Or do we spontaneously react as a genuine Dharma practitioner? These very basic things are what we need to, to really shift our perspective on this world. I think integrity is the most important thing for a Dharma practitioner. that how we present ourselves is how we are. And that if people really want to trust us as practitioners, as monastics, we should be worthy of that trust. And if we're not, then why not? And we should get ourselves together because one of the real problems has always been that so many exemplars of the Dharma are exposed as being not worthy of that. Partly because people's ideals are perhaps too high and they couldn't manage it. But also because they lacked integrity. The Buddha said of himself, that what I think, I say, and what I say, I do. And in this way, he said that this was, this much I can claim for myself. And this, I think, is very important for all of us, that we have that quality of inner and outer integrity, so that people can trust us. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're greatly enlightened, it doesn't mean we're bodhisattvas, it doesn't mean that we're anything special. But what we are saying is what we truly believe, and what we truly believe is what we're trying to do. This, I think, is the most important thing for all of you to remember. And, as a community, to live in harmony. And to love and respect each other. Because, um, if we study the Vinaya, we see that it, much of the rules are dealing just with keeping our harmonious Sangha. And that is, is so essential, not to have inner divisions and um, little you know, 
personality jars. It doesn't mean that you don't that you don't always agree with each other or that you know there are not sometimes conflicts. But within that, you can resolve them if you genuinely respect and love each other and put the the welfare and the well-being <coughs> of the community uh, beyond your own personal desires and ambitions. I think as the Dharma has gone to the West, um, it has uh, brought a lot of the wisdom and the compassion of the Buddha to the West. And it is, you know, there's so many teachers have been working so hard to really um, help the Dharma to flourish in the West, and this is a wonderful thing. But on the whole, uh, there has been something of an imbalance for the first time in Buddhist history, insofar as that the monastic Sangha, which was so close to the heart of the Buddha, has on the whole been overlooked or set aside. And the harmonious relationship of the monastic Sangha with the lay Sangha has not been emphasized. The Buddha himself again and again and again stressed the importance of the fourfold Sangha, of ordained monks, ordained nuns, lay men, lay women, and how they should all live together and mutually help and support each other. And he felt that when there was the fourfold Sangha, then the Dharma would very much flourish and um, it would be, be very fruitful. But it was very important that all four aspects, like a table with four legs, should be there for the Dharma to be correctly transmitted and practiced. And on the whole, in the West, um, this table has been supported on two legs of the uh, lay community and the monastic community, which, as I say, was so important to the Buddha, himself being a monk, uh, has been overlooked. And so that unique, um, what can one say, you know, interconnection between the monastics and the lay is usually not um, appreciated or, or undertaken in, in the West. And so I think it's very important that this should not be overlooked and that it should be cultivated. The, the monastics helping and teaching and um, inspiring the lay community, the lay community studying and practicing under the guidance and supporting and helping the monastic community and the two sides really supporting each other. So this Eko Vihara is an excellent project because you are trying to bring together the monastics and the lay community in a way that the Buddha himself encouraged and, and envisioned. And so I really wish you a tremendous success with this. I think it's a very important thing for you to be doing. And uh, this is, I uh, hopefully, the way forward now in, in the Dharma propagation in foreign countries. So it's wonderful what you're doing, and I totally support it. Thank you so much.